here. This is Corinna Bench, and welcome to the My Digital Farmer podcast. In today's market, it's not enough to just grow your product. You've got to know how to sell it, too. Welcome to the My Digital Farmer podcast, where we reveal online marketing strategies and tips to help farmers like you get better and more competent at marketing. Learn how to find more customers, increase your sales, and build a strong brand for your farm. Let's start the show. Hey guys, welcome to episode 25 of the My Digital Farmer podcast. I am your host, Corinna Bench from My Digital Farmer and Shared Legacy Farms out near Toledo, Ohio. Hope you guys are doing great today. Thanks for joining me. If you are here for the first time, I want to say a special welcome to you. Hit that subscribe button if you enjoy this podcast. I would love to have you come back each week and learn a new tip or tactic to help you get better at marketing and messaging your farm. Now, this particular episode and podcast in general is really designed for CSA farmers because that is my mojo. But a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today can be applied to all kinds of farm businesses. So I hope you're going to get a lot of value out of this episode. The topic today is overcoming, identifying and overcoming your customers' objections to buying your product. And we're going to really dive in deep into why that's happening and what you can do about it. So why aren't customers buying your CSA? You work so hard to find leads. They even say that they're interested. Has that ever happened to you where someone tells you, oh, I'm going to join, I'm going to sign up. And then they walk away and you never hear from them again. They show interest, but then it seems like it goes nowhere. So what is happening? Why does that occur? Well, they are experiencing a very common thing in the buying cycle, in the marketing world, customer objections. And customer objections keep people from saying yes to your product. They function as roadblocks or speed bumps in the buying cycle. So in some cases, they literally create a barrier that keeps a person from moving forward. And sometimes these objections will just slow down the purchasing process, effectively like a speed bump. So you've got to learn how to deal with them, how to identify what these objections are, or your sales cycle will bottleneck. People will just kind of stop moving through your brand. So that's the topic of today's episode because I believe that all great marketers study their customers' objections and then come up with a way to handle them in their sales process. So today's show notes can be found at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash 25. All right, so this past weekend, I took my kids... Jed and Josiah to the Toledo Zoo, which is an awesome zoo, by the way, to go on the Aerial Challenge course. And the Aerial Challenge course is a new feature, fairly new feature at the Toledo Zoo. It's a high ropes course. And for two hours, we climbed up on these really high elements and braved our fears, overcame them with courage and had some really awesome times. I mean, I got to go down a zip line, spend some great time with my kids. Now, I have been wanting to do this forever, but something has been holding me back from actually going online and getting the tickets and booking the date for my family. And as I prepared this episode today, I was thinking about that. I'm like, well, what was it? Because that's a very practical example. Like, What was it that kept me from moving forward? I mean, I wanted to do Uh, a high ropes course. I've done them before in the past. I know what they're like. And I thought my kids might be ready, but there was something that was keeping me from buying. And as I reflected, I thought, okay, well, there's a few reasons. Number one, I wasn't sure if both my kids could take it. So I knew that Jed, my oldest was probably ready, but I wasn't sure about my eight-year-old. And frankly, I wasn't even sure if he was tall enough or heavy enough. I didn't want to go and actually have to like research that and figure that out. 
Um, and I didn't want to show up at the zoo as a walk on and, you know, get there and then have them say, oh, well, your other son's too young. He can't do it. And then I, you know, what am I going to do with Josiah while I go up with Jed on the high ropes? I can't do that. Or I was worried that one of them might freeze up. Like maybe Josiah's too young and he just says he's ready, but then he gets there and freaks out and wouldn't like it. Okay. So that was one whole kind of thing in my head that was going, going through my mind. Then there was a financial piece because not only did I have to pay for the $25 per person fee um, to go and do this experience, which for me wasn't that bad, but I was going to have to pay for a zoo entrance ticket for each person too. And that's um, also quite a bit of money, at least at the Toledo Zoo it is. So I knew that this was going to be a bit of a financial investment. So I wanted to make sure that my kids were ready and that they were really solidly into this before I plopped down, you know, 160 bucks for this experience. Um, and then another reason was it was just hot. It was really hot in the summer. And I knew that you couldn't take anything with you when you go up onto these high ropes courses. Like it's just your harness and that's it. And so I was worried about just heat exhaustion. I know that may sound silly to you as farmers, but I'm a redhead. I have fair skin. I don't really do well in the heat. And I was like, I can't bring water. Like, how are we going to be up there for two hours? Okay. So, and then finally the website said that you had to order your tickets online, but every time I went there to try and figure that out, it was like darkened. Like I couldn't click on it. It didn't work. The link was dead. And so I just always assumed that they were sold out. And I finally called and just said, Hey, how can I get on this wait list so that I can schedule this event with my kids? And they're like, Oh no, we don't sell them online anymore. So anyway, each of these um, objections were sticking points for me. And taken together, they were effectively acting as speed bumps and keeping me from moving forward. Now, just interestingly, I found out while doing the aerial adventure that they provided cold water at all the tower stations. Um, so that objection was dealt with. I didn't have to worry about water, but that wasn't communicated anywhere in their marketing. And so in the back of my mind, I was like, man, I wish I could tell them that because that was a hang up for me. And if I had known that, that would have been an objection that would have been wiped away. So I wonder, let's just do a thought exercise here. Whatever you're doing, just take a pause and ask yourself this question. What objections do your CSA customers have? Do you even know? So let me just share a few of mine that I know my customers have. And I've talked about these before on the podcast and other episodes. In no particular order, I know that I have people who say to themselves, well, my kids are picky eaters or my husband is a picky eater. I'm not sure that we would eat everything that you give us in the box. Another objection is, where are your pickup sites? Like just not even knowing where, how that process works and where they would pick up. Um, the price, you know, what? $410? That's too much money all at once. I can't just plop that down. Do you have a payment plan? They just don't know if we have a payment plan and they don't want to take the time to look that up and figure it out. And then just what exactly is going to be in the box? What if I don't like it? Is it going to just be kale, kale, and kale or what? So that's just a short list of some of the objections that I know my customer has. And I know that because I've asked them and because I get those questions a lot when people are calling me and thinking about trying it out. So whatever that list of objections is for you, write those down. And I want you to kind of spiral around them as we go through the rest of this episode. Because what I want us to think about now is what are you going to do to help deal with those objections? It's not enough to know what they are, but you've got to have a strategy for handling them so that you can remove those roadblocks, cut down those speed bumps, and make it smooth sailing to the buy now button. Customers will have objections. They're going to have questions that stop them. This is normal, okay? You should expect this and you should not stand idly by and do nothing about it. Your job is to identify what they are and then overcome them. 
all good salespeople, sales teams understand this principle. And in fact, when you go through the process of researching your ideal customer, this is one of the things that you're researching. What are the objections that you had in the buying process before you signed up? And you find out a ton of information from your current customers. They'll tell you what tripped them up. And you keep track of those things so that you can address them for your sales to your future customers. Your customer will not move forward until you deal with their objections. Now, when I learned this concept, it really helped me because it helped me focus on where to start creating content for my marketing strategy first. I actually began here. This is when I, when I first started discovering this marketing journey for myself. Uh, it was overwhelming. There were a lot of things that I could work on first. I decided, let me chip away at these frequently asked questions, these objections, and create marketing assets that will deal with them first. And I slowly built them into place. And one by one, they have helped many of the barriers fall for my customers. Customers now walk right through my brand's journey that I have engineered for them. So today, I want to walk you through how you can identify these objections in advance and how you can use them to develop a marketing strategy that will convince your leads to get over their fears and objections and finally make the purchase. So my goal by the end of this mini training is to give you several very hands-on practical ideas you can start working on right now to slowly blow down those roadblocks. Now, I'm going to be publishing this episode in September, and that's kind of the ideal time to really start taking this stuff seriously because hopefully you're crafting some kind of a process to get your current CSA members to renew their membership early, like an early bird campaign of some sort. And so this is the time to kind of break down some of those questions. Or maybe you're crafting a sales process for people who are leads, who are who are not in your current customer base yet, and you want to try and get them to sign up before Christmas, well, you're going to have to come up with a process for answering these objections and knocking down some of these barriers. So let's start out by talking about the types of objections that you might run into. Okay, so number one, um, I call this the research phase type of objection. So this is where there isn't enough of the right information on your website. Are you answering the questions on your website that your customer actually has? So we have a great example of this that's very real and present for me right now. Um, it has to do with pickup sites. So I have a spot on my website. It's underneath the uh, CSA trial box tab on my navigation bar. And this page is the CSA pickup sites. And in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, yeah, if somebody wants to buy my CSA, they're going to click on the CSA trial box tab. And then these other options are going to appear and they're going to see pickup sites and they're going to click on that. And that's how they're going to find out what the pickup sites are. Here's what I learned. People did not intuitively know how to find that. They were not going to click on that tab. They were just scrolling through my website homepage. And I don't have the pickup sites listed on that sales page. How did I find out that this was a sticking point? Because I was getting emails from like five, five or six people over the course of maybe a month reached out to me and said, hey, I'm interested in getting your four-week trial, but what are your pickup sites? I can't figure it out from your website. Now, I have to be honest. In my mind, I'm like, Ugh, really? It's like there. There's a whole page about it. Just click on this menu tab and you'll see pickup sites. But you know what? It's not intuitive for your customers. So figure out what are those things that are really, really important, that information that they are actually researching, and put it in a really obvious, obvious place. So if they can't find what they're looking for, guess what happens? They stop looking, they get exhausted, and they click away. Doesn't mean they might not get motivated and try again or, you know, email you or call you about it. But a lot of times it's just like, man, this is too hard to find. So I'm just going to wait until later. And it turns into 
a speed bump for them. So this is a type of objection. It's just something um, when your customer is in the research phase where you don't have enough of the right information on your website. So ask yourself, are you answering the questions that your customer actually has through your marketing? Pay attention to what those are. Okay, number two type of objection. There's confusion over the plan, what I call the plan, or the buying process. What are the actual steps to starting to do business with you? So if somebody is thinking about joining your CSA, what is step one? Like, how do they begin this process with you? Map it out in your communication plan to them. Like, hey, step one, download the harvest calendar to see what's going to be in your box. Okay. Step two, decide which type of share you want to get. Step three, pick your pickup site. Step four, put it in your cart and purchase. Um, step five, get your email from me, onboarding you into the tribe. This is too many steps, by the way. You shouldn't have five steps, but you get what I mean. Like, what is the plan of attack? Help your customer prospects see where they're going so that if they had to cross this raging river and get to the other side, show them what the stepping stones are so they can see, okay, that's when I know that I'm done. When I get to the end of the side, when I get to pick up my first box, that's when I have finished this buying plan with you. Okay. So a lot of times there's just confusion over how many steps there are going to be to get into your product. They can't find the buy now button because it's not clear or they're not sure which share type they should get. Perhaps there are too many choices uh, or they're not even sure when that decision should be made. Um, So help them understand what is step one, what is step two, what is step three. Okay, so that tends to be a type of objection, just confusion over how do I start doing business with you? What are the step-by-step parts of this? Okay. Number three, this, this third type of objection is a lack of clarity about the offer itself. So, um, how much does it cost? What all comes with it? Uh, what are the benefits of your offer and the features? Will it really give them this transformation that they're looking for. Remember, it's it's not just this external need of, oh, I need some vegetables, but they're really buying from you as the local farmer for a deeper reason, an additional reason. Yes, they want fresh vegetables, okay? But maybe it's like, hey, I really want to feel like I'm helping the local farmer or, hey, I really want to feel like I'm making some healthy decisions for my family um, or, you know, I had cancer and so like I need to do organic and that's really important to me. You know, it's, it's different for everyone, but you've got to make sure that you've communicated in your offer what all the features and benefits are. And sometimes a person can come to your website or wherever you're publicizing this information and they just can't get clarity about everything that's in the package. And that just stops them. That becomes a roadblock for them. Um, the fourth type of objection kind of category is what I would call... Um, like not being sure that they connect with you. So this lack of empathy. Um, I think it's really important for you as the business owner and the marketer, your goal should be to get them to trust you first. Especially with CSA, so many people are signing up for it because they want to build a relationship with a farmer. They really want to get to know you. And so they want to make sure that I actually like this guy or girl, like that I click with them and that their values are what I imagine them to be or what I want them to be in my head. And so that tends to be a tripping up point for a while. It kind of stalls the buying process while they check you out, while they get to know you through your social media or through your emails that you might send them, or maybe in person at the market as they meet you. Like, do I like this person? Is this of all the farmers, you know, that are at the market or in my community, like, which one am I going to choose? Do I, do I like this one? Um, Is this the one I like the best? So my husband happens to be very, very charismatic. I'm sort of the type A girl in the business, and I tend to just be all business. So sometimes I forget to do the warm and fuzzy like check-in questions like, hey, how you doing? My husband is the total opposite. He is so good with people. He will just talk and talk and talk. 
forever. And that is a really big strength of his. And I know that this helps us as a brand because when they meet him, they're like, oh, what a cool guy. Like, I totally want to support this guy. So um, just be aware that making sure you find a way to establish this empathy and connection with your customer, that really matters. You might have to overcome that first. All right. And then the fifth type of objection that I want to bring up here is that in many cases, we haven't as farmers helped minimize the risk for people. So once they start to research what CSA is all about, they become aware that, hey, there's there's a possibility that I might not get um, everything in my box, right? We might have tornadoes strike or we might have a bad year. We might have flooding and or there just might be this fear like, what if I don't like this? What if I want to sign up? I legitimately want to give this a go. And then it's like not a fit or I end up having to travel a ton. Sometimes there's just this fear of signing up because they're not sure that they're going to be able to make that commitment and show up every week. And so they just hit the pause button. And so if there was a way for you to be like, you know what, you can get out of this. So we didn't always say that as a CSA in our first five or six years, like it was a no, there was a, you know, like a a big phrase in the contract, like, look, if you sign up, like you're in it to the end, no refunds. But now that we have an established brand and we have a lot of people that are on our sampler sign up sheet or our, our wait list, I feel comfortable if there's a customer who isn't really getting into this and maximizing their experience, I feel like I could reach out to them and say, listen, um, if you want to back out, I can, you know, pay you for the weeks that you haven't gotten your box yet. And I feel okay doing that. And now I can actually say that in my marketing. I can talk about, hey, we're pretty sure that you're going to love this if you've gone through my funnel the way I've kind of prescribed it. You've gone through these questions and I've sort of weeded out people. But if you go through this experience and you really hate it, like I will refund you your money for what you haven't purchased yet. And so in by doing that, I help minimize the risk for our customers. So um, I think that that's just something to think about. You may not be in a position where you can do that, but I wanted to make you aware that that is definitely an objection that customers have to joining a CSA, as I'm sure you're aware. And so that is something that you may decide that you want to deal with. So let's talk about how we create a strategy in our marketing here at Shared Legacy Farms that will handle these objections and how we can unlock our customer and get them to start moving forward. So um, I've broken this up into a few steps and, uh, The first step is that you have to identify your objections. And I want to encourage you to just don't go crazy with this. Identify maybe the top five objections or three. If five is too many, just pick three. And the way that you can do this is by asking yourself this question. What are your frequently asked questions that you get from your customers? You know what these are. You probably can list them off right now on one hand. These are the questions, the email questions that you get all the time. And every business is going to have different ones that are unique to you. But there are patterns that emerge in a CSA model. And I've already mentioned a few of them. Um, But things like, what if I don't like what I get in my box? Do I get to choose? Or what's going to be in my box? What can I even expect? Do I have to pay all at once? So questions about payment plans. Um, Am I going to waste the food? Are you organic? What does that mean? Um, I don't know how to eat all the food that you grow. Am I going to waste it? How do you help me? Can I get out of it if I don't like it? Uh, What if I'm out of town? Do you let me hold my box? I don't understand how this works. What are your pickup sites? I mean, I just went through 10. But like figure out what are those top five frequently asked questions. That's a place where you can look first to figure out some of those objections. Another way that you can identify these top objections is to survey your customers or interview them on the telephone. You can pick 10 of your best customers and ask them, hey, way back when you first signed up, like what were those sticking points for you? Or why didn't you buy right away at first? What was what was holding you back? Um, but you can do this via survey or like I said, through a telephone interview and write down what people are telling you. Write this information down and keep track of the ones that are mentioned 
most frequently. Okay, so that's kind of how I do step one, how I figure out what those top five objections are. Now, I just want to mention here that I have a short kind of workshop course. It's called Customer Research Bootcamp, and I've designed it for CSA farmers. And this is a really short course that's really going to teach you how to go about researching your ideal customer, figuring out um, all the different details that you need to know so that you can message and market to them better. And one of the things you're going to have to learn to do is get inside their head, figure out what is that information I need to know about them so that I can write better copy in my uh, sales pages on my website or in my emails or even when I'm talking face to face and I'm following like a sales script in my mind. So the first step in marketing is to know your ideal client, know everything you can about them. And one of the things that you will be uh, researching that I talk about in that course, uh, in that workshop is how to find these objections. So if you want to learn more about that, um, it's something you can take this fall when you are done with farming and you have a little bit of a break. It could be part of your continuing education. You can go to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash research to read all about it. Okay, step two, once you've identified what those objections are, you want to create content around the objections. All right, so this is what I do. Um, And I'm going to give you a few examples of the different kinds of content that you could make. It doesn't have to be just emails. It could be a lot of other mediums. So um, the first one I'm going to talk about is videos. So I try to do a uh, what's in a box video on my Facebook business page about every three weeks. I literally unbox one of our boxes and you could do the same thing. And you could download that video off of Facebook and put it up on YouTube and then link that up either in a future social media post or in an email marketing campaign that you create. So creating a video around uh, that answers one of these objections is a great idea. Another example would be creating an email sales sequence where you have one entire email in that email drip campaign that answers uh, a particular objection. Or maybe if you have seven emails in that drip campaign, two of them are about two of your most common objections and you handle them, you talk about them, you overcome them. You could also, um, on the website copy uh, of your sales page, you could have a section that addresses each objection. I know that's something that I do. If you were to go to sharedlegacyfarms.com to see an example of a sales page for a CSA product, you just scroll down and you'll see that I have several sections that that were put there, that were created specifically to handle the objections I know my customer has to answer some of those questions. So there's a section about what's going to be in the box. There's a section that deals with the organic seal and that we're organic, what that means. There's a section that talks about how do I know what to do with all this food? And then I talk about the support that we provide and the coaching. So just kind of go look at that as an example and you'll see how I decided what to put on that sales page in many cases based on the questions and the objections that I know my customer has. You could also turn or create content around your objections through a lead magnet. So I have talked a lot, you're probably sick of hearing about it, about my lead magnet called the Harvest Calendar. This is just a big table or grid that lists all the vegetables that we grow on the left side. And then on the uh, upper columns, I have, you know, the 18 weeks of the season and it's a giant grid. And I fill in the blanks or fill in the boxes so they can get a rough idea of when they might see a particular vegetable in their box. This is a hugely popular download for me. When people come to my website, That is one of the things that they can click on to grab this harvest calendar to answer that question of what's going to be in my box. And it answers that question for them. And in many cases, that's all they need. And then they're ready to move forward. Another one is my, is CSA right for you? Um, I have that as a PDF where they can read the six questions that I think they should ask before they join my CSA to help them determine if it would be perfect for them. But I've also turned it into a three-part video series series, so they can click on um, a, a form, enter their email address, and then they get taken to a page that has like the, the two, excuse me, the three two-minute videos that slowly breaks down that content 
in video format. So again, turn your content that's handling that objection into some kind of a lead magnet. Now you also have their email address and you can begin to pitch them and warm them up. Testimonials are also a great piece of content to collect to handle objections. So this could be like a video testimonial that you get from one of your customers, or it could just be a post with a picture of one of your customers holding their box and writing out, you know, a testimonial that they gave you. And this can be especially powerful if the testimonial they write deals with the objection. So um, I had a customer who wrote a testimonial one time who talked on and on about how powerful our Facebook group was for our private Facebook group for a CSA and how that's where she got all this coaching and she learned how to do all kinds of cool things with our food. And if you read between the lines of that testimonial, it's getting at that objection of, well, am I going to know how to cook this? Okay. And she didn't word it exactly that way, but that's essentially what it was doing. So not only am I just sharing a testimonial on my social pages that says, hey, you know, there are people who like the CSA, but she's highlighting a very specific feature that helps overcome a common objection. I hope that makes sense. Um, You can also do case studies of a particular customer. You could do an interview with one of them and then share those findings in an email or an audio interview or a blog post series. Maybe you could do like three or four blog post series on case studies of CSA members, and you're going to have tons of testimonial quotes in there that basically handle many of these objections. I hope you're getting a lot of ideas from this, but we're going to keep going. I have more. Other content that you can use to create um, help for these objections. Um, You might actually create a solution to the objection itself as part of your offer. There's some sort of value add. What do I mean by this? So um, a Facebook group for your CSA community could in some ways be seen as a solution. So if there's this disconnect happening between you and your customer base or people don't really feel connected or they don't know what to do with their food, well, you could decide, I'm going to create a private Facebook group. I'm going to add that to my offer. And inside that group, I'm going to show up every week and do a, a video unboxing and kind of talk them through how to store the stuff. And I might show up one other time with um, an idea for what they can do or cook Uh, with something from my box. Okay. So that's actually a solution that you have added into your product that helps handle a particular objection. Now in the fall, I always offer a special workshop for how to create and build a really engaged private Facebook group for your CSA. It's really designed for CSA farmers. And if you're interested in that, I will put a link in the show notes where you can get more information about how to find out when that opens up. Um, another idea is uh, like Harvey. If many of you are, are using Harvey as your CSA software management software, um, that could be the solution that you create to handle this objection of, well, I want to have my choose your own adventure box every week. I want to be able to decide what's going to go in there from week to week. And so if that is a major sticking point for your customers, you could say, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to decide to go with Harvey or something like Harvey. And that's going to now be this value add that I can talk about. Okay. So sometimes you just have to literally add on something, create a solution to an objection and add it to your offer. Um, Refunds or guarantees. This is something that you can create to handle an objection as well. This is getting at that that risk, right? We want to remove the risk for someone as much as we can or minimize the risk or the perception of risk. So what is the refund policy that you have? Make sure that you state it at some point on the checkout page or on the sales page. Uh, You could have that CSA, is CSA right for you lead magnet is a really great way to kind of deal with this refund or guarantee thing because I talk about Um, You can talk about that in one of your questions that you ask them. That could be a sticking point for some people and you can kind of address it. Um, Another way is to offer something like a trial membership where you would do like a four-week sampler box. It's something that we do. And this is a way for to remove the risk. It's like, hey, you're not sure you're going to like this. You don't want to plop down the cash for 18, 22 weeks, whatever. I get that. How about you just try it for four weeks 
get our sampler, see if it's, you know, a good fit. You'll get it every two weeks. And that should be enough time to help you kind of figure out if this gig is something that you like. Okay, so those are some examples of how you can remove risk for someone and create content or products around that objection. Um, another piece of content you can create here is, is what I call continuing education. Um, this is top of funnel information. So at the top of my funnel, when people are first entering my sphere of influence, learning about me that I even exist, I spend a lot of time educating my audience. So ask yourself, what can I teach to help educate my future buyer? So they, uh, they may not even know what um, some of their objections are going to be yet. So before they're even warming up, you can be creating content that's going to be dealing with some of these objections, answering some of those questions through the way that you talk and teach about your product. So that's also one example. And then a couple more. Um, give them your actual recommendation of what you think they should buy. I think this is a really awesome tip. Uh and so when I say create content around an objection, sometimes people are overwhelmed by all the choices that you have on your product page, especially if you have multiple seasons, uh, people can kind of come in and out or, you know, they can do uh, a spring share and then add on these three bonus type shares. You know what I mean? Like it can be overwhelming to, to, to know how to piecemeal that together. And so sometimes to minimize that confusion, what I have been, I have been coached by some of my mentors. They're like, you know what? The first time that someone's purchasing something from you, it's really, really helpful to just tell them what to buy. Give them your recommended list. So I was at Zim, uh, Zingerman's Deli out in Ann Arbor, Michigan a few, uh, last weekend, and uh, I went there with my friends. We had gone tubing and we decided to get a sandwich there. And I love Zingerman's. But as I walked in to the, the checkout area where, or where you're going to order your sandwich, I was overwhelmed. Uh, and I still, I'm not saying, I love Zingerman's. Zingerman's, if you're listening, oh my God, you're amazing. And we all, we all love your marketing. Okay. You're like the model for us. But there is a lot of overwhelm. You look at the, the menu items. There are so many sandwiches, so many words to read. And you can sort of shut down and be like, I have no idea what to get. Okay. But what they did do is they sort of had like a top 10 list, you know, the best sandwiches. And I'm like, oh, thank God. So, you know, you look at that on their menu item and it just narrows it down. So that's what I'm talking about here for you. If you have a lot of choices, maybe just the first time that someone buys Give them your recommendation. Say, here's what I think you should get the first time. And then that gives them time as they get to know you and, and understand some of the other products you sell. Then they might get a, a slightly different product suite the next time. And I actually do that now for our standard size share and our full size box. A very common question is like, which box size should I get for four people? You would be surprised how many times people are wondering that. And I finally realized, man, that question is holding people back. So I now tell people in an email, and sometimes I even pop in on a video or post it in my social groups. I just say, listen, if you're thinking about doing this, just get the standard size share. 90% of our customers get that. That's what you should start with. And you know what? It's so freeing. It just removes the question marks for those customers. And they're like, okay, good. That's what you recommend. Boom. This is like when you go to a restaurant, right? And you sit down and you look at the menu and there's so many choices. And do you ever just ask the waiter, hey, you know what? What's the best thing here? And then they tell you that's what you order, right? So that's what we're doing here. We're creating content by giving them our best recommendation. Remove the confusion. Okay, last kind of strategy here for creating content around objections is to ask this question, what is the transformation that you are promising with your product. Be clear on not only the pain point that your customer has, that you know they have, why they're coming to you, that inner problem, but also how your product is going to handle it, how it's going to meet it. So in your tagline, in your email copy, 
um, on your website, sales page copy, like you should be super star clear about what, how their life is going to be different, the before and after phase. Why does it matter if you get this box? It's not just that I'm going to be giving you calories and feeding you food. Like I'm giving you something else. Your life is going to look like this. You're going to feel like this. These little inner values are going to be check marked off in your mind when you purchase this product. Talk about that. Create content around that because that's why people buy. They buy solutions to inner problems, not external problems. Okay. So figure out what that internal problem is of your customer, that motivation, and then talk about the transformation that comes about. Okay. That was a ton of ideas for how you can create content to handle those objections. I hope you can pick out at least one or two from them to get started this fall as you're starting to work through your strategy. Um, Step three, once you've sort of identified and created some content, is to actually execute it, right? Execute that content and follow up with your leads. So you're going to need a way to follow up with people who are interested. Oh my gosh, how many times have I had somebody come to a CSA pickup site And they're like a substitute for someone else. Like they've gone on vacation and they sent a sub and the sub's like, yeah, I'm going to take this box. And I mean, this happened to me last two weeks ago and I still made this mistake. And they actually said to me, do you have any information about your CSA? Like, because I think I might want to do this and I might want to do like this four week trial. And I was like, yeah. And so kudos to me. I actually have a little business size card that I was able to pass to them that had the website where they could go and learn about the sampler and sign up for the sampler. And then I gave them a brochure about my farm that talked a little bit about pricing. And I was like, here you go. And then they left. And then, you know, 30 seconds later, I am kicking myself because I'm like, ah, I did not get their email address. Like I could have just said, hey, can I have your email address and I can send you some information. Um, you know, that, that was just such an obvious mistake. And I just, oh, I was so upset with myself. But my point here is that you need to find a way to follow up with people who show interest in your product. And the email address is, at least in my opinion, the number one thing that you can be collecting, the number one asset to allow you to continue to follow up and build that relationship. So the email address is why or grabbing that email address from someone is why my sales sequence is doing the heavy lifting, right? If I can get their email address and plug them into my CSA pitch, that allows the CSA sales sequence inside my email service provider to start building a relationship with them. And that sales sequence has been written in such a way to work on those objections that those customers have and handle them. Now, another thing that you could do is you could uh, pixel these customers that are coming to your website or who are uh, maybe clicking on some kind of a Facebook ad that takes them to a place on your website. You can pixel them and then retarget those people who, um, who you have pixeled with another type of ad on Facebook. So that is also an option that you have open to you. So you want to be following up with your leads once you have executed this content. Another strategy that I feel like we don't do enough of anymore is call people, call people on the phone. So my, my friend, Kathy, uh, her sister-in-law lives in Canada and she sells of all things, helicopter rides at this ski resort. And these are really expensive rides. This is a very high end customer that she's marketing to. I want to say the rides were like over a thousand dollars each for a seat in the helicopter. Um, And she isn't going for that kind of a product. She's probably not going to be getting results with email marketing. That's something where she gets on the phone and, and talks through the offer with people breaking down the barriers that way. Okay. Um, So sometimes it's just best to call people on the phone. If you have a way to do that and just say, Hey, I understand that you're interested in my product. Do you have any questions? about it or what's holding you back? Is there a particular thing you're concerned about? And then just start talking through. I think it's sometimes helpful to have a sales script written down. So if you have a customer service team 
or a bigger farm, you could actually be preparing a sales script where you write down answers to the common objections that you know people have so that if they come up, your sales team knows kind of what the line is, like how you handle those objections with your product and train them on how to talk through that script so it doesn't sound so canned. Okay, so step three is to execute that content and actually follow up with your leads, whether it's through an email sales sequence or getting on the phone or pixeling them on your website so you can retarget them with ads, whatever. Okay, and then finally, step four is to go for the sale, right? You actually have to ask for someone to make a decision. And, you know, if you've done your job right and you've created a lot of really valuable content and you've led with value and you've built this relationship, you've given them a lot away for free, it's not going to be as hard to finally ask them to say yes or no, especially if you're like, look, I want this to be what's best for you. And if you're not sold on it, if this is not something you want to do right now, that's fine. If you're willing to walk away and not make it a big deal, it just takes the pressure off the table. So once you've dealt with those objections, you can much more confidently ask for the sale. Okay, so let's just review those four steps again. Number one, you need to identify your top five objections. Step two, create content that handles each of those five objections. And I gave you a ton of ideas. Uh, step three, actually execute that content, follow up with those leads, handle the objection. And then step four, don't forget to actually ask for the sale. Don't be afraid to do that. So your call to action, let's get this party started, okay, is step one of those four steps process there. I want you to start out by writing down your top five objections. If that's all you can get to this week and just put it on a whiteboard somewhere, um, that's all I want you to do. Figure out what those type of top five objections are. Now, if you want to take it a little bit step further, brainstorm a piece of content that you could create to handle one of them, okay? Just one of them. And then don't worry about making it right now. If you don't have time, put that on your to-do list for the fall. But at least try to figure out what are those top five things that I've got to be able to handle and what's one really cool piece of content that I could make in the next few weeks or sometime in the next month, this winter, where I can start chipping away and I can handle one of those objections. And then make it, all right? Make that piece of content to handle it. All right, well, I hope this was helpful. Show notes can be found at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash 25. And subscribe to the podcast if you enjoyed this episode. Leave me a rating and review and subscribe. Every week I watch the number of my downloads go up just a little bit. So I'm trying to get the word out to as many farmers as possible. If you find this helpful, talk it up with your friends when you're out conferencing this winter. Let people know that we exist out here at My Digital Farmer and, and encourage them to start listening to the podcast too. All right, next week I have a really fun episode kind of a bonus episode that follows this particular one. I am going to be taking the content that I just walked you through from this episode, all about objections, and I'm going to make it very real. So last spring, I purchased a side of beef for the first time ever. Yes, this suburb turned farmer's wife took me that long to finally get one. And let me tell you, I have been wanting to do this for like at least five years, but something kept holding me back. And I had a lot of objections. I had a lot of questions. I had a lot of confusion. And so I am going to let all of you beef CSA farmers out there who are listening, I'm going to let you inside my head to see what kinds of things your prospective customers might be getting hung up on. Because I have a feeling I am a lot like your ideal customer avatar. And I'm going to be taking this stuff we just walked through, all the objections, all the questions. I'm going to be giving those to you on a nice silver platter. And you're going to be taking fast and furious notes. You're going to see how do you take this concept that I just taught you and put it into practice for a real working uh, beef CSA or meat CSA. So I hope it's going to be really practical, really actionable, 
so you can see how to take this training and make it real for your brand. So tune in to that particular case study next week. And until then, keep farming. I will talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.